Uh, and over the phone, we are joined by Seth DeStefano. Uh, Seth, can you hear us? Sure, Karen. Can you hear me, Delegate? Yeah, I can hear you great. I love it when people call me Delegate. It's, it's Mike. You don't have to call me Delegate. Huh? <laughs> that chair just gets a little higher every time someone calls you that. <laughs> Seth, Seth is with the West Virginia Senate on uh, Center of Budget Control, correct? Did I get your title Center correct? Budget and Policy. Budget and Policy, that's right. Seth, what do you have for us today? So I just, um, I thought maybe just a couple of things from interims um, we could talk about, and then um, I'm happy to maybe take some questions uh, from Dealer's Choice on your all's end if you want. <laughs> that's fantastic. Um, yeah, so like one of the things, Mike, that I, I really wanted to point out from um, the legislative interims that just took place last week um, was a, a kind of an emerging tension, if you will, uh, between the legislature and the governor's office regarding Medicaid funding, right? Um, and so for those listening, uh, Medicaid is, um, I think, probably the single um, biggest um, health insurance, health care uh, initiative in West Virginia. Um, it is a federally matching program, and so for every dollar West Virginia puts up, we receive roughly about $3 back from the federal government. Um, and this not only supports um, folks who are low income to have health care. It also is really the bedrock of the entire health care delivery system in West Virginia. And that's to say that, you know, these billions of, of dollars that come into West Virginia through Medicaid um, have a big part in keeping our hospitals and community health care centers um, open and available. And I'll talk more about that maybe here in a minute. But how do you give you some perspective on kind of what happened during interims? I want to back it up a little bit to regular session um, when um, folks, including Mike there, were putting the finishing touches on the budget um, that started July 1st of this year, and they got a little surprise. And that surprise was that there was a potential clawback of about $450-ish million um, that the state could have been on the hook for, right? And so lawmakers elected to pass what they called the skinny budget. They basically said, listen, we don't want to pass a hard, fast number in March if, in fact, the federal government's going to come in and say you have to pay back all this money in federal education money from COVID. And so what we'll do is we'll pass this placeholder budget now, and then once once this particular issue is settled, we're going to come back um, and, and fill in the gaps afterwards, right? Um, that placeholder budget included a lot of cuts, including to Medicaid. Um, it was around, I think, about $160 million cut to Medicaid and state dollars. Um, turns out that clawback didn't happen, right? So. The legislature did come back in special session. They came back in May, and they passed, amongst other things, several supplemental appropriation bills. Uh, one of those bills was Senate Bill 1001 that allocated $183 million um, between uh, the Departments of Health and the Departments of Human Services. Almost all of it went to the Department of Human Services um, for Medicaid funding. Um, and here's where things kind of get interesting. Um, there are, are folks um, kind of within the administration who are saying, well, yes, the legislature passed this money, but um, we, the executive, are not really allowed to spend it because there were restrictions within that supplemental that said you can only spend this money after you spend all the rest of the money in the particular line items that were cut in the original budget. Well, you're down to 20 percent, I think, is, is the wording. Is yeah. that right, Seth? That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So, like, it was, you know, you can only, you know, number one, you can only reserve the money send it to, you know, in this reserve fund to the line items that were cut and only after you spend down that line item completely. Um, so things kind of, you know, simmer, if you will, it. And in the midst of this child care debate, um, a lot of folks from around the state, a real grassroots movement is building around child care access um, in West Virginia. The governor came under some pretty significant pressure. Um, and, and a lot of people felt and, and perhaps still feel that he is not doing enough um, and so Dr. Persley with the um, Department of Human Services made a big statement, came out and said very, very clearly, said, no, it's not the governor's problem to deal with child care. The legislature has to expend funds. And the reason the legislature has to expend funds is because we can't touch that reserve money, right? There are too many strings attached to that reserve fund, that $183 million um, that, that don't allow us to do that. Well, this elicited a response um, from multiple members um, within um, the Republican caucus there, um, who said, actually, no, if you look at the bill, um, the, the final instructions in the bill say that really um, the, the department, the secretary can, in fact, spend that money in the manner that they see fit. They just have to submit a report to the legislature um, at, you know, monthly as to where these expenses are going. And so this bubbled up both in uh, the, the Joint Committee on Government and Finance, 
Um, Delegate Amy Summers asked some very pointed questions and, and literally came out and said, no, I don't think, um, you know, you are beholden to not spend this money. I think that it's very clear in the, the, that you, you can spend it how you want. Delegate Clay Riley echoed those sentiments, um, as, as did others. And this is why this is really, really important. Um, the original cut to Medicaid um, in the regular session budget, um, when you combine that with the federal matching funds, um, comes in in the neighborhood, I think, of, of over five to six hundred million dollars once you put it all together. Um, losing that from Medicaid would be pretty devastating for West, for West Virginia on multiple fronts. And so I think it's important to, to talk about this, both with your listeners um, and to kind of keep an eye on this, because really what we I think what would be best for West Virginia just in general is for the governor to use the authority that the legislature gave him and secure these federal matching funds for the rest of the fiscal year for Medicaid. I hope that makes sense, and I didn't, I didn't go on too no, much. No, Seth, I think you explained that really, really well, because during the uh, interim session in finance, when, uh, when that presentation was being made and, and Delegate Riley was, was asking some very poignant questions, I got the sense that they were choosing not to spend down this this money as opposed to saying, hey, we can't. I, I, I really got that feeling from them, and I got the feeling from everybody else. that They kept saying we have about $640 million that we can appropriate still this year, correct? I think that possibly through um, potential um, fiscal year 2024 budget surplus, maybe. I'll have to double-check my, my numbers back on that. Um, but the, uh, like to me, I think, I think you made the point, right? That's kind of the impression I came away with too, right? So there was the, you know, the big statement from, you know, Dr. Persley, there's a lot of pressure based on just this issue of childcare in general. Um, and then Dr. Persley makes this statement. Um, and really Dr. You know, they would, the governor's people take the governor's position, right? That's how it works. When yeah. someone speaks for the administration, they speak on behalf of the governor. Um, and they came out and said, no, 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 the legislature has to do this. And the reason the legislature has to do this is because there's all these strings attached to this. And then Delegate Riley, I thought very methodically, pointed out, and really what he did was he just pointed out the language in the bill, yeah. right, that, you know, notwithstanding provided this, that, and the other, the department can spend the money. Right? And if, so if they, they wait till like, March, they're not going to be able to yeah. draw down that money. And you just brought up a great point because the last piece of that little there is that there's a provision um, in, in that special session appropriation that any of these dollars that are not spent by March 31st by 2025 are going to go back into general revenue. And once they go back into general revenue, Medicaid will never see them again. And we will yep. be out um, significant federal matching funds. Um, and that, that's going to create some real problems, not just for people who rely on Medicaid directly. I, it's it's going to cause problems for communities across the state in so much as Medicaid is a, a major driver of what like keeps hospitals open. It keeps community health clinics open. It's for a lot of people, it's their only avenue um, to treatment from opioid addiction and these types of things. So I think this is definitely something we need to be talking about more and keeping a light on. And I really hope that in the months to come, we can really encourage the governor before he leaves town um, to, to secure these federal matching dollars with the authority and the power that the legislature already gave him. And I, you, know, you and I might disagree about federal money and things like that, but leaving that kind of three to one match on the mm -hmm. table, mm -hmm. um, you know, West Virginia is, is a taker state. We always always have been, but we have a lot of conditions in our state that make us like that. And I think uh, in, in in this case, I agree with you, Steph. What type of reasoning is the executive branch giving for uh, other than trying to pass the buck? But I mean, why why not go ahead and take care of this matter now? Um, it's a, it, that is a fantastic question. Um, I, I have yet to hear um, a, a reasoning in my mind that is compatible with the words on the page um, that that are what the governor signed during special session. And, and by that, what I mean is, is that you know, the, the, and I'm, you know, everyone here um, has kind of been around the block more than a couple of times. You know that when a bill becomes a law, there are multiple back and forths, right? They'll, so you know, you'll have the bill as introduced. And then the bill that gets taken up in committee, even before questions asked in committee, um, that bill has generally changed and in many ways changed significantly. Um, then committees will go to work on a bill, right? Then the bill will advance to the floor. And then a lot of times um, the entire floor will make changes to the bill. They'll launch it over to the other chamber who will do the same thing over and over and there's constant back and forth. 
um, in one iteration, I think, of this appropriation, there were some pretty tight strings attached to how those dollars were spent. And I think most of those um, strings originated in the state Senate. I don't think that they, I don't think the House was near as interested in micromanaging the department in that way. Um, and I, I just, my, my, I'm trying to wonder if, if the department is under the impression um, that all these strings still exist when I think a lot of people believe that no, these strings aren't really there. What is there, um, as, as Mike pointed out, um, is a ticking clock that says if you don't spend these dollars, they're going to get pulled into general revenue on April 1st, um, 2025. Once that happens, um, Medicaid, and I, just, I think it's fair to say, Medicaid's never going to see them again if that's the case. Yeah, I, I think if, if they don't spend it, that's never going to be in the budget again. Uh, but they did have a $330 million surplus from last year come, that got moved over too, right, Seth? I think that there was some surplus dollars in certain parts um, that, that built... Uh, my understanding, because this goes back to April, so please right. forgive me if my memory gets a little fuzzy on this, but during April interims, um, when um, some folks, it was either during April or maybe May, when they called the, the special session during interims, um, the, the, the department kind of came under fire for potentially not spending money down that they had access to. Um, and so I think that um, a lot of this also kind of um, revolved around um, folks who have intellectual and developmental disabilities and, and want to be able to remain at home as opposed to being pushed into, um, you know, managed or nursing home care. And there were some, some leftover dollars, I think, from previous fiscal years. Um, and the explanation, I think, given by the department, and I'll, I'll, I'll stand up for the department in this particular sense, because the explanation they gave at the time I thought made sense was that they were allocating certain budget um, amount for certain services um, but because of the combination of the pandemic and really nobody wanting anyone in their home for a couple of years, um, coupled with um, the, the woefully low pay that in-home providers get, um, made it difficult to actually, you know, spend all that money, all, all, you know, in, in a given fiscal year, if that makes sense. But yeah, they had they, the ability to increase the IDD waiver uh, compensation to to the companies but they hadn't done it and i know yes. just recently they did raise it a certain amount and i think the doctor said most people were, were being reimbursed at an 18 dollar an hour rate and uh, the people i've talked to it just it's just not the facts it's just, it, yeah it, um and i and i think that they're hopefully that i think it's the myers um something or other study that uh, the legislature yeah. Um, commissioned and went through and said, listen, if you want to help fix this problem, you need to pay these people more. That's a long story short, it's just about as simple as that, right? Yeah. If you want to recruit um, and, and retain um, folks into these positions where they, you know, they go to people's homes for a few hours a day and they provide these services so, so folks can live in the dignity of their own home and, and not have to get pushed into, you know, managed care where it's honestly a lot more expensive for taxpayers as well. And you, you need to pay these folks a living wage. Um, and, and for for, for, you know, for what felt like a long time, that just those, those rates did not change. I think they are getting ready to change. That was something that kind of came up during interims, um, that there are going to be some changes to the provider rates in this particular area. So that is, some, I think, some welcome news for folks. Um, but still, we, we still have this kind of March 31st, 2025, you know, attempt, if you will, to kind of pick Medicaid's pocket looming. Um, and so I just, I think it's important for the listeners out there, for the, you know, folks listening to the Eastern Panhandle, um, folks around West Virginia, that it, it does appear that there is this tension uh, between the governor's office, um, you know, saying they don't have the ability to spend this money and the legislature that is saying, no, we very clearly gave you the ability to spend this money. You really should be doing it, right? You, you know, we, we said you could spend this money, go ahead and do it, which is really one of the biggest functions of the legislature is to appropriate funding, right? Um, so, you know, that's kind of where we are with that. And um, just something I think we really need to keep a close eye on uh, between now and, um, you know, whenever Governor Justice moves on from the governorship. Bill. So, Seth, um, this is Bill. Um, I, you know, I have to wonder how close is the final budget um, in comparison to what the governor initially had set the budget to be, because I'm actually a representative of a, a I'm a public health director and probably one of the, I guess, the senior one across our state, been doing it for a while, but we um, we had proposed funds to be able to be put into our line item budgets for the year. And then, as you talked about, the clawback money um, was taken back. So we were 
lost about <clears throat> from the proposed budget of what the governor had out there, lost about four million dollars. And then, yeah, those those funds would put back into a pot of money to be utilized at the discretion. Um, meanwhile, we're trying to rebuild infrastructure across the state coming out of that pandemic, knowing how understaffed we were to be able to handle such a thing in West Virginia. But we lose $4 million that's going to try to increase that infrastructure, but the money is just sitting there, not being utilized for anything and not coming back out to those uh, departments that needed to cross our state. So how close do you think that we ended up being with the governor's proposed budget to where it actually is now? So, I mean, like, um, just first of all, uh, Bill, if I may, um, thank you and thank everyone who works um, within the public health department infrastructure throughout the state and throughout the country. You all literally do the Lord's work um, under oftentimes very difficult circumstances, um, both, you know, fiscally and I would say, I'll just come right out saying politically, it can be kind of difficult um, to be in that, that space. And thank you so much for doing that. Um, I think that the, you know, the answer to your question, um, while, while slightly complicated, um, is that you know, technically speaking, um, you know, the, the, the governor's budget, um, we came in a good bit over, right? So, you, you know, I'm sure everyone is fond of hearing the governor's announcements uh, at the beginning of every single month about how much surplus we have. I feel like we've been hearing that for the last, you know, several years at this point. Um, the, the problem that kind of belies in, in those announcements um, is what I would consider kind of like a, a structural flaw in the budgeting process in West Virginia that exists in the constitutional sense. So in the West Virginia state constitution, um, West Virginia's governor has um, almost complete and total control over the budget process, right? Um, and, and the manner in which the governor and the executive have control over the budget process is through kind of a, an arcane, obscure mechanism called the revenue estimate, right? And I've talked about this on the show before a few times. Um, the revenue estimate is, you know, revenue estimates are something that state legislatures and governors around the country have to do every year, right? When you're sitting down and you're thinking about, you know, putting together a budget for the next fiscal year, one of the first questions you have to answer is, how much money do we think we're going to take in in the next fiscal year, right? Um, in other states around the country, this is a very collaborative process, right? where the governor will put out a number and then the state legislature will come back and say, well, we don't think that number's right. We think you're off because of these factors. Um, and then even in other states, the public, the general public is given a, a mechanism to provide input on that. Um, in West Virginia, we don't do it that way. In West Virginia, we are an outlier where the governor has the sole discretion over that particular number. And one of the problems we've seen that I think is leading to what you're talking about, both with you know, money being withheld from public health departments and money being withheld from from other, you know, important agencies that do important work and provide public services to people um, is that the governor has been setting that number artificially low for a while. Um, and so the way I, the way I, you know, kind of describe this to folks is, is imagine if, you know, we're all sitting around and playing, you know, a game of spades with each other, right? Um, and me and Mike are on a team and Mike asks me how many tricks I'm going to get in that hand. And I've got a blockbuster hand. I know I've got a blockbuster hand. And I think, honestly, if I'm being honest about the situation, um, I would say that I'm going to take seven or eight trips, right? But I decide to lowball it, and I say, well, I'm only going to take four. That's kind of what we've been doing from the revenue estimate perspective for a while, is that we've, we've basically taken a situation, and the governor has said, listen, under all reasonable circumstances, we should expect to take in this much but we're going to say it's this much. We're going to say it's maybe a billion dollars less or half a billion dollars less. Um, and then more or less every at the beginning of every month, we're going to talk about how much extra revenue we have. Um, but the problem is, um, it, you know, one, one, one of many problems is that the legislature is bound by that number. Right. Does that make sense to everyone? So like the legislature can't go in and say, listen, you you underestimated these revenues way too much. Our public health departments need $4 million more million than what you put in there. So we're just going to give them – we're, we're going to add to the revenue estimate by $4 million. Um, the legislature can't do that. They have to adhere to the overall number that the governor gives them. And so in order to provide that $4 million to help build out that infrastructure that you're talking about, they, had, you know, they would have to take it from somewhere else, which is, which is where things kind of get tricky and then where we end up kind of living in this world where – 
a lot of these very important agencies um, that, that do very important work have to kind of rely on budget surplus supplementals year over year over year over year. I think in this case, though, Seth, that money is appropriated for the health departments. It's just been put in that reserve um, that reserve fund. It hasn't been accessed or asked for yet. Oh, um, I, I think, apologize. I think uh, I the, yeah. the, the overall... I, and I, I don't blame the governor. I think it's overall the legislature likes to keep those revenue numbers low so that we don't spend it. And then that way you could use one-time spending each year with the surpluses. So I, I do think it's the governor's office that, that leads that. And you, you're absolutely right in the way you explain that. Um, but I do think the House and the Senate does like that system and the way it works. And that's just my feeling that I get. And I, I have to agree with you, delegate. That um, <laughs> as he rises up a little bit more, it, it is you know the governor did see the importance of putting those extra dollars and even in public health across the state when we yeah. had a, 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 a study done we saw we were 16 million dollars um, under where we should be in comparison to neighboring states and so when you add that additional money that was cut from the budget without replenishing it. It makes it, you know, I guess at the end of the day, you're going to have those dollars that are going to be sent back to the legislature because they weren't utilized. But instead, you're taking a chance of, of cutting short your public health department. And that's where the frustration on our part comes is why are they not asking for these funds and putting them where they're supposed to be now? Why are they waiting to, to march? And, and it's not just the Medicaid funds. It's each of those line items. Right. Why are they not? We just want to know where the money's going. And that's where I think Senator Tarr came in and said, hey, listen, I want to, I want to report each month of where this money's going. They don't want to jump through the hoops, the department. Right. And, and just jump through the hoops and you'll get, you, you get everything you want. But it's all appropriate. That's a, pretty, that's a pretty low lift for the executive as well. Right. You know what I mean? Like you just yeah. come in monthly and you say, here's where we spent the money. I just kind of want to throw that out there. That's yeah. not terribly hard. Um, and I, Bill, I apologize. I misunderstood your question. I thought you were talking about the budget at large, um, not the. Uh, I think I, I, I think you did I, good, Seth. Yeah. I, yeah. I apologize for that. No, I, I had both questions there for you. So you did hit one of them. <laughs> Matt, I, I'm just. Uh, it, trying to you know crawl through the the weeds if you will of of all of this and where it sounds like money is available but you can't get to it and that that just boggles my mind when a state agency like bill is talking about says we need this funding but you can't get to it and there was a lot of frustration uh as seth said that the delegate riley delegate summers a lot of people were just questioning and then it just seemed to me that they kept coming up with this number of 640 million you guys can still spend 640 million this year so i do have a feeling he may call us into special session to do something but we don't know what it is yet i, I don't think we can get to that extra five percent tax cut i don't think that's and that would be a special session before the end in of this october, year maybe right I mean, that'd be the first time he could do it isn't it in october um, December? Correct. I don't think that the, um, you know, September special session is slated for Parkersburg. Yeah, so we won't and, be doing um, anything there. No, excuse me, September interims, if, yeah. if you will. Um, so we, we, it would have to be, I think either he would have to call the legislature in outside of interims, which is not likely. I don't think would no, happen. that would cost too much. Um, yeah, it's very expensive. Um, or wait until October, so. We got about 60 seconds left. Seth, what would you like to explain to our audience or leave our audience with for the last uh, minute? You know, I, you know, Mike, I thank you guys for having me on. I just want to make an appeal um, for your listeners to really um, dig in and, and pay attention to the legislative interims. Um, I, you know, I talk with my coalition partners and I talk around the state as to the importance um, to even just if you're keeping up with basic news coverage. If you don't have time to, like, tune into a meeting in the middle of the day, that's perfectly understandable. We all got stuff to do. But, um, you know, the, the things that are discussed and the tensions that are brought out in the interim sessions are very, very important. Um, to the day-to-day -day lives um, of our friends, of our neighbors, really of all of us. Um, you can, you know, pull up, you know, what the agenda meetings. You go to wvlegislature.gov. Um, you can find out when the interims are. And it's also, you know, a great time if you can get away to make a trip to Charleston um, and have some, some pointed conversations with your representatives. Um, and outside of that, um, you know, let's make sure we get those federal dollars, matching dollars for Medicaid. And I uh, look forward to seeing you and talking to you next time. Thanks, Seth. Appreciate your time. You are listening to TV 10 and WRNR.